think we have a problem with the projection. So um, unless we get it to work, we just won't worry about it, okay? Yeah. Just wanted to say that there's an exercise that I like doing with uh, youth. I've done it with uh, different grades of, of children. Well, usually grade five and up at the school, and I've done it with a number of youth groups. <clears throat> and I may have told you about it before, but I want to say it again here this morning because it, uh, it, it demonstrates something very important. What I do is I ask them to make a list of the 10 things that are most important in their life. And these things could be people, they could be activities, they could be uh, any number of things. It could even be, it could even be things like love, uh, marriage, family, anything like that. But the 10 most important things. And then I get them to make a second list. And that second list is asking them to put them in priority. So what comes first, second, third, fourth, and so on? That's a little more difficult. So they make the list of the 10 things that are most important to them now. And so then I put a condition on them. I say, okay, now that's list one and two. Now I want you to go to list three. And this time, I want you to believe that for some reason, you have been given a very difficult, difficult diagnosis. And you only have one year in which to live. Now take a look at your list. And I want you to rearrange that list as you feel it should be rearranged, knowing what you know now that you just have one year to live. And very often what happens is certain things get adjusted in terms of the order of things. And uh, sometimes things drop off the list. And sometimes things get added that they never thought of before. And then I tell them, okay, let's go to list number four. And it's going to be a very stringent condition. And that is that you have been given, you know, the emergency broadcast system has come over the, the PA. And you have only got minutes to live. Sadly, there has been some kind of nuclear exchange. And you only have minutes to live. Now take a look at your list and adjust it accordingly, knowing that. And I think you can imagine that a lot of things will drop off that list and certain things will start rising to the top and nine times out of ten, the thing at the very top would be their faith, God, and that is what comes up to the top. And then family and then things below that. But the very first thing is God. And it wasn't always there. For some it was, but most of the time it was kind of down here on the list. And the faith in God came up until the very top. And that's because there is such a stringent condition that all of a sudden, you know, somebody once said you can see more through a tear than through a telescope. In other words, when things become tragic, then all of a sudden that reorganizes your priorities pretty quickly. And you suddenly know what is most important in your life. And so then we have a discussion as to why it is that we sometimes don't keep God as number one priority. Uh, and we talk about the fact why that tends to drop down in the list. And what can we do as we move forward in life to bring faith and the Father to the top of the list? Now, when we read things like Luke, which we just did, Luke 21 and Mark 13 and Matthew 24, uh, what happens is with Revelation, combined with Revelation, those chapters in the Bible can become some of the most frightening that we read. And you know, when we hear of end times, we hear of things like the sun being darkened, the moon without light, stars falling from the heavens. We quite naturally, I think one of the reactions is either we become fearful or we become dismissive. And we kind of set it aside. Same thing as in our priority list. You know, God just kind of gets put down number three or four unless things really become critical. We either become fearful or we become dismissive. But this is not the way we as Christians ought to respond. Neither one of those possibilities is right for us. Because this event that we're talking about, the second coming of Christ, is the event for which our lives of faith have been lived. 
And I wonder if you noticed the last verse of the gospel that we read. Lift up your eyes, for behold, what's coming? Your, your redemption is coming nigh. Yeah. Let me just read from Romans chapter 8. It says this. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. For creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up until the present time. So this second coming of Christ is our redemption day. It is our redemption day. And Jesus tells us to be ready and he tells us to be vigilant. And when Jesus tells us something, we ought to perk up, best sit up and take notice. Because he calls us to prepare for that day. And all of scripture's prophecy will be fulfilled in that day. And you know, the early church, it lived day by day, moment by no moment, with the expectant return of Jesus. And it came to be known as a doctrine, and they called it the doctrine of imminence. And something that's imminent means something that could happen at any moment. And the early Christian church lived in that moment, preparing and being ready if the second coming of Christ should happen in that particular moment. And you know, as we are here now in the day, uh, year of 2023, I suspect that that coming is not as far away as we think. Let me read from Romans 13. And do this, understanding the present time, for the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. And in Matthew it says, therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. It's imminent, it could happen at any moment. And Jesus tells us to watch for it. The trumpet will sound and the voice will, there will be a shout from heaven and Christ will come and raise us up to be with him forever. And one thing for sure, we not not to fear because fear is not of the Lord. We need to be confident that the Lord stands ready to welcome us. The only reason we might fear is because we've been procrastinating, right, in our relationship to our Father. It's not something that can wait. We must not wait until something happens in our life that kind of gets our attention. You know, it could be ill health or an accident or economic misfortune or wars and the rumors of war. Those things may get our attention, but to make right our relationship with God is the most important priority that you and I ought to have. And we need to get it, get on it in the right way and right away. Now it's true that the apocalyptic language of Luke 21 and Mark and Matthew, you know, they do come with some warnings of the end of the world. And that sort of thing, you know, we are told that we are to be watching. We are to be watching the signs. We do not know the day or the hour, but we are to be watching the signs. And those signs can be pretty frightening if we let them. But you know, life itself can be very frightening. I mean, think of those who lived through the Second World War. I'm sure 45 million or more people died during the Second World War. They must have thought that too was perhaps the coming of the end. Or how about the people who live in South Sudan right now and people who live in Uganda or the Ivory Coast or other places where people are being persecuted? Or how about the people living in the Ukraine right now? There are so many situations and things in our life that cause us to want to retreat in fear, but we must not do that. 
Sometimes it must seem like the end of the world are in places far away, but Jesus says it will be coming to all of us. It is coming. There is no doubt about that. He said he would come again, and he makes promises and he keeps promises. And you know, we do need to be ready. We do need to be ready. You may remember me telling you a number of times about this pastor from the South who reminded his young people who were going off to college that uh, they have to remember that no matter how successful their life or no matter how much money they make in those years ahead or how important they become, eventually the day is going to come where they're going to throw you in a hole and throw dirt on your face and go back to the church and eat egg salad, he says. And then he says, the only thing that's going to matter is your testimony. How you lived your life for Christ. That's the only thing that's going to matter. And you know, we're not immune from the prophecies of Scripture. And if we are not here to witness to the great coming, then rest assured, Christ will come. And we will not be prepared. He says, be prepared, and we need not fear, we just must prepare. Jesus said it. He wants us to do it. The world will end someday. This world will end. Jesus says there will be a new earth and a new heaven, but someday this world will end. And whether we are here or not at that time to witness it, there will be a day when you and I will meet our Lord, irregardless of whether or not we're there for that second coming. We will then be with the Lord when he comes again. And that will be a wonderful experience. But you know, each one of us is going to meet the Lord one way or another. And we ought to be prepared. And I don't think we take it too seriously as Christians, a lot of us. We kind of set that stuff aside. Book of Revelation, we just don't think we can understand it. We don't want to consider it. It's maybe just too much for us. The symbolism is a little bit too harsh. And so we kind of set it aside. We put it down on our list of priorities. But it's such an important book. Just like Genesis is such an important book. Nothing makes sense in the Bible unless you have a good, solid understanding of the book of Genesis. And similarly, nothing makes sense unless you understand or at least consider the book of Revelation. Kind of like the bookends of the whole history, not only of God's people, but the whole history of the world. Jesus says to prepare. There is a book written some, some, some years ago, and it was called Out of Africa, and the person who wrote it, her name was Einek Dinesen. And in that book, she tells about a Kenyan named Kamanti, who was her cook. And she says that one night after midnight, the cook suddenly came into her bedroom and asked her, told her to quickly get up. And the cook had never come into her bedroom before. So she felt it must be something urgent. And you know what he said? I think you better get up. He said, I think God is coming. Now he wasn't a believer at the time, but he had been witnessed to by Isaac many times. And he said, I think God is coming. And so she went with him out to the front window of the dining room and looked out over the, over the hills of, of Africa and the plains, and lo and behold, there was a massive red, red pillar going straight up, and it looked like a figure coming to, towards them. Oh, thank you very much, Sheila. Thank you. It looked like there was a, a pillar, or it was a pillar coming towards them, and it looked like a person. And her cook had assumed that that was the presence of God coming across the plain. What was happening was the plains were on fire. The hills were on fire. Everything was on fire and the flame, the red flame shooting straight up looked like a figure coming across. And she tried to explain that to him and he sort of said, well, maybe. But he said, I thought you better get up because it could be God coming. And when I read that, I thought to myself, this, this guy probably has a better understanding 
And not only that, but also has a, a greater awareness of the second coming of Christ than I would say most of the church. Because very often the church kind of avoids that subject altogether and doesn't want to go there. And that's unfortunate because that goes against what Jesus said we ought to do. We ought to be preparing and looking for that day when that shout and that trumpet will call and we will be raised up. And some of the church, they say, well, but we, we, we don't want to consider it because there's no such thing as uh, the rapture. You don't see the rapture in scripture. And the rapture, of course, refers to that, first, that, that Thessalonians reference, which was read by Renata, where a shout will come and a trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised first, and then we will meet the Lord in the clouds. And they said, well, the word rapture, well, okay, sure it doesn't, but you know, in the Latin translation, the word was raptura, and that was where the word rapture comes from. So yes, it is in the scripture. It's in the old Latin translation. In Hebrew, it's called something else. But in Latin, it's raptura. Herpatso is the, is the Hebrew, or, or the Greek. But in the original Latin translation, it was raptura. So the rapture is there. But whatever you call it, the reality is it's going to happen. Because Jesus says it's going to happen. And he says to be ready. And sometimes when we look at that stuff, when we look at Revelation and we look at Mark 13 and Matthew 24, we begin to wonder and we begin to doubt and we wonder, is God still in charge? We look at the world around us. We're living in a very strange time, very bizarre. Things are happening that we never thought would happen before. And some people would say, as they look at these signs, that things are converging. There's a converging of many things coming together, and that should be a sign that we ought to take that as a warning, or at least as a call, a trumpet call to prepare. But always remember that God is still in charge. I like when one pastor says, he says, God is large and in charge. Bishop Desmond Tutu, who I'm sure you know from South Africa, great Christian. He spoke once about the struggle that he had in life and with God and understanding God and so on. And he said he recalls his favorite cartoon. And he said it's, it's, it's a sketch about God standing before a file cabinet. The file cabinet is open. Files are all over the floor. It looks like he's frantically searching for something. And then the caption below it says, God saying, oh no, I seem to have lost my copy of the divine plan. Well, God hasn't lost the copy of the divine plan. We look at things happening around us and we wonder where is all this going? But God is in charge. And God will stay in charge. And he's in charge of our lives because we walk by faith, not by sight. If we live in faith, we do not fear. We do not fear. A theologian by the name of Gregory Fisher one time was teaching a class and I'm not exactly sure where it was. It was in, I think it was the West African Bible College. And he was teaching this class and he was discussing the second coming of Christ. And a student put his hand up in the back and he said, I have a question, he said. He said, in Thessalonians it says there will be a shout and a trumpet call. He says, I want to know what that shout is going to be. And uh, Gregory Fisher, he thought for a moment, and he thought that what he would do is he would kind of answer and say, well, we shouldn't take things past what Scripture has revealed to us. And he said that to the student, but that wasn't enough for him. He says, that's all fine and good. He said, but I want to know what that shout is going to be. And Gregory thought for a moment. He said, I think I know what it's going to be. It's going to be enough. Enough. He will shout enough when he returns. And the student looked rather puzzled. What do you mean by enough? And Gregory says, enough suffering, 
enough starvation, enough war, enough pain, enough death, enough terror, enough indignity, enough lives trapped, you know, in, in hopelessness, enough sickness, enough disease, enough pain, enough pain, hurt, hatred, I should say, enough, it is enough. He will shout, enough. And then we will be raised to meet him in the clouds. I think he has something there. It's very possible that's what the shout will be. But God's plan is that it will come. The time will come when there will be no more suffering, no more death, no more despair, no more evil, no more injustice. It'll all be done away with. It will be enough. Enough of this. And whenever that happens, whatever comes our way, we can trust God. We can trust our future to him because God is in control. The great and glorious day is coming. That will be the day of our salvation. And in Luke chapter 21, we just read a few moments ago, when these things begin to happen, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing nigh. So live life in an imminent way. Live your Christian life as if that moment could come at any time. And live it such that whatever you happen to be saying, whatever you happen to be doing, whatever you happen to be thinking at the time, you are always ready if that moment should come right now. Let's pray. Father God, uh, as we have said many times, your word is true. And you're a person who, you're a, you're a God, I should say, who not only makes promises, but keeps his promises. And we know that that day will come when your son will return again with a shout and a trumpet call, and we will be caught up in the clouds to meet him there. And then, Father, it goes on from there the thousand-year reign, and then finally the final battle with evil, and then the new heaven and the new earth. Our day of redemption is drawing nigh. Inspire us to be prepared, to live a life as if that could happen at any moment, even right now. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.